Romans, the eighth chapter. Adrian Rogers made this statement in a book he wrote titled The Kingdom Authority. He said this, quote, In order to be over the things that God has put under you, you must be under the things that God has put over you. End quote. We'll give it to you again because it doesn't sink the first time. In order to be over the things that God has put under you, you must be under the things that God has put over you. Now, just in case you're wondering what those things may be, just a short list of those things, one of those things would be the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Another of those things would be the authority of the Word of God, the Scripture. And another would be the authority of what we talked about Sunday, the authority of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I remember growing up in church, they would elect officers for different things, and, and not just in church, but they would elect officers and there would be a president and a vice president and a second vice president and a third vice president, and you always wondered about what what did that third vice president do? You know, two or three people either have to be absent or die for that person to ever even get close enough to the top to ever think about making a decision. And and, 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 and I mention that because when a lot of times when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we, we say, and, and I say it as well, the third person of the Godhead. As in there's a level of importance God the Father is the president, and Jesus is the vice president, and the Holy Spirit's the second vice president. So he, he's, he's way down the authority level. And that's not true. The Holy Spirit is God. He's God. And we, as God's people, we are to live under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Somebody else made a statement one time about leadership, and uh, I forgot to turn my phone on. I was supposed to shoot this for my wife. Oh, well, too late now. And, and, and they said this about leadership. They said, uh, if, if you can't, think how it went here. If you can't be a follower, you can't be a leader. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. Now, I'm going to read you the first four verses of Romans, the eighth chapter. But then for us to really understand what that's talking about, we've got to go back to the fifth and sixth chapter, and, and, and we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to do that in a minute. But here's what it says in the eighth chapter, the first verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, for us to understand what Paul's talking about in chapter 8, we've got to go back. So go back to chapter 5. We're not going to read a whole lot of verses out of there, but we're going to, we're going to go back into verse 5, chapter 5 and chapter 6, and, and kind of get a it's kind of like Pete trying to get that train going yesterday at the zoo. He had to, he had to back that thing up and get a running start because the track was wet. Well, sometimes when we're looking at Scripture and we read something and it just doesn't click any, anywhere, any way, we have to get scoot back a little bit and get a running start. So, so that's what we're going to do tonight to, to understand this. And what we're going to talk about, I, I tried to find one this evening, but I couldn't locate one. 
But you remember, that at least when I was young, they, they had a, it wasn't, a, it wasn't necessarily a children's Bible, but be a Bible in ever 40 or 50 pages or so, there would be a picture. And over in Genesis, there would be a picture of usually the Garden of Eden, and you flip that page over, and there'd be a, probably one of the, of the ark or something along that line. And as you go through, it was different pictures about different things. And, and, and I thought about it. I, I, I probably could have Googled it and, and found a, something what I was looking for, but I remember looking at those pictures. And, and I remember that book that used to be, remember that book that used to be in the doctor's office? It may still be. I don't go to the doctor anymore, but very often. But there was a Bible sort of a book. And it had all kind of stories in it and had pictures that sort of illustrated those stories. And, and I got to thinking about that picture that I can that I can still see in my mind about, about the Garden of Eden. And, and we look at that picture and we say, man, I, wouldn't it be great to, to, to go back there? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be good to, to, to be able to, to, to go to that place and, and for things to, to be that way? And, but, but what I want to talk about tonight is this, is, it is, what, is what we lost in Adam because of sin but what we find in Jesus Christ. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and spoil the whole party for you. What we find in Christ is far better than what we ever had in Adam. So, so this, this passage of Scripture, look, look back at the 17th verse of chapter 5. This will kind of be where we start. This is a, this is a key verse, and it says this. It says, For if by the one man, and that, that one man is who? That's Adam. I said, if, if by the one man's offense, death reigned, through the one, much more those, and, and I think that those includes us, who received the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one. Who is that one? That's Jesus. Christ. Now, now this verse tells us this. It tells us about two kingdoms. And it tells us about two kingdoms that want to reign, R-E-I-G-N, over us. And it tells us about a man that heads up each kingdom. The, the one is Adam, the other is Jesus. And, and every one of us in this room tonight, we belong to one count or the other. We belong to one of these kingdoms. We either belong to the kingdom that Adam would be the head of, or we belong to the kingdom that Jesus is the head of. Adam is the kingdom of death, and Jesus is the kingdom of life. And we all, we all belong to one of those kingdoms tonight. Well, when, when, we, when we get over here in this, in this verse, verse 17, we run into two M words that are, that are stuck together. And we run into these M words, I think, five different times. But what it tells us, and what we will see in just a few minutes, is, is, is the much more that, that we read in that verse. When we read a much more, we find out that we have much more in Christ than we ever did or would have had in Adam. So, so let's begin to go through here and look at the things that we lost or that we inherit from Adam. Now, what, what, we, what, what we find there is, is, is Adam... When Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden tree, they partook of the forbidden fruit, they, in essence, sold themselves into slavery. They became slaves to sin from, from that point forward. Now, the children, this is what I read, the children of slaves are also slaves. Now, we, we, we know where we immediately came from. I immediately came from Charles and Ruth Cowley. They came from their sets of parents, and so on it goes. But, but somewhere down the line, somewhere, however many greats we would have to stick on there, we all generated from here. Some way, somehow, and I don't know what the family tree would look like that would trace its way all the way back down here to, to Adam, but, but, but this, is, this, is, this is where we've come from. So we're, in essence, we're children of slaves. And, 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 and we are... When we're born into this world, we're slaves to sin. We're, we're, we're just slaves to sin. Now, 
What do we inherit from this relationship? Well, one of the things that we inherit is we inherit weakness rather than strength. Now, Romans 5, 6 says this, when we were still without strength. Now, that's not talking about your guns, these kind of guns. This is talking about spiritual weakness. And, and, and in essence, what it's saying, and we talked about this Sunday, is, is we don't have the power, we don't even have the ability in and of ourselves to be and to do what God wants us to do and be. He tells us to be holy. Can Steve Coward be holy on Steve Coward's account? No. It, can, can Steve Coward love his enemy? No. Can Steve Coward do all the things that the Word of God tells Steve Coward that he needs to do? No. So therefore, he gives me a, a helper. So, so what I inherit from great, 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 great grandfather Adam is I inherit weakness. And, and, and I still have a bit of that weakness in, in areas of my life. I, I, I still have that. So, 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 so we inherit weakness. Then, then we stay in that same verse. We find out that we also inherit wickedness. Now here's what the end of that same verse, verse 6 in chapter 5 says. It says, we were still without strength. In due time, who did Christ die for? It said the ungodly. Did you know that included us? The ungodly. The, we were created to be godly. But we find out that the Word of God tells us that, that, that we were ungodly. God made us to be like Him. Being unlike God, is the, that's our problem. And, and, and what happens today is this in, in, in churches, and I believe it happens all across America. I know, I'm, I'm sure that it happens here at Trinity. Is we sit in church, and we hear a teacher teach, or we hear a preacher preach, and they preach about sin. And sometimes, if we're not careful, we sit there and we gaze around the room wondering, well, who's he talking about? And we never realize that it's us. It's us. We're, 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 we're sinners. Listen, here's what we do. As is, is we, we measure ourselves always against somebody that's going to make us look good. Don't we? I was in school and didn't make a good grade. I didn't go to the person that was going to be the valedictorian of the class and say, Dad, you ought to see what the valedictorian of the class made because that would make me look bad, worse than I already looked. I always picked somebody that was lesser. If I made a C, I picked somebody that made a D, or I made it up that they made a D anyway. And that's that's the way that we do things. And we still we we, we don't grow out of it. If we're not careful, we still do it. And and we begin to compare ourselves and measure ourselves against somebody that's lesser than what we are. Because it makes us look better. And it makes us look better. But what, what the Bible says is the Bible says this in Romans 3.23. It says we've all sinned. And we didn't come short of the glory of Rick Williams. And we don't come short of the glory of Steve Coward. We come short of the glory of God. So our measuring rod is not any of us. Our measuring rod is not somebody that would be laying in the proverbial gutter on the side of the road somewhere in a drunken stupor. Our measure is God. And when we use the correct person to measure against, I will assure you that when we begin to talk about the fact that we're sinners, we don't have to look around the room. We don't even have to look across the table that we're sitting at tonight because it's us. It's us. We, we, we come short of the glory of God. So we inherit from, from Papa Adam, we inherit wickedness rather than godliness. Then we also inherit wrath rather than approval. 
The Bible says in the fifth chapter, the ninth verse, much more than having now been justified by his, Jesus' blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And that him, again, is a reference to Jesus because, because of what we are. We all know what we are? Sinners. Because of what we are, we're headed, without Christ, we're headed to eternal hell. That's, that's where we're headed. It is not politically correct. It is not politically polite. It is not politically accepted to talk about the wrath of God. Because all we want to talk about nowadays is we want to talk about the love of God. And the love of God is wonderful. The love of God is great, but the wrath of God is real. It's absolutely real. Some of you knew my dad, and, and I've been asked numbers of times if there was ever a time when he didn't smile. And I'll tell you, yes, there sure was. There were times when I didn't just know the smile that everybody talked about. I knew the wrath of Charles Calvin. I still remember the sound of the belt coming, the, the little jingle that the little metal part there makes. And I remember the sound. <laughs> and I knew what sound was coming next. I liked the one coming out a whole lot better than I liked the next one. But as, as loving as he was, and he was, God bless him, he was. There was also a side of him that didn't put up with a lot of things. And, and listen, I believe that's also true with God the Father. The Bible teaches us about the wrath of God, and it says in, in this verse, it says that having been... Uh, so having been reconciled, we shall, let me, let me find where I just, I was reading the wrong verse. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, so, so, so we inherit this wrath rather than approval. We inherit that from Paul Paul Allen. We also inherit warfare. In, in, in Romans 5.10, the Bible says, and we talked about this verse several weeks ago, for if when we were enemies, enemies. And enemies has to do with, 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 with warfare. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, and there's that much more word, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So from, from Adam, we inherit warfare rather than peace. That, that, that's what we inherit. Now, I, I was reading something by R.C. Sproul, I think it was last night. And he was talking about sin, and oh, R.C. Sproul, he's a pretty, he's a pretty straight shooter. And, and, and he, sa he said this about sin, I, I didn't get it all written down, but he, he, called, he called sin cosmic treason against the Most High God. He said, we look at sin, and we just compare here that measuring stick we use again. I, I know I sin, but I don't sin as bad as he does, or she does, or they do, or somebody else does. And my sin's not as big as, as their sin or any of those things. But R.C. Sproul said, any sin, from the ones that we categorize as little white ones to the ones that we consider as murder and, and all, of the, all of the other, the big sins as we relate to them, he said, any sin is, is cosmic treason, treason against the almighty God of heaven. He said, the reason we don't see it right is because we don't see him for who he is. sin. And we inherit warfare rather than peace. So we inherit weakness, wickedness, wrath, and warfare. Now, if we get all of those things from our natural birth, we're just born into that world. What do we get in this born again world? You know, we, we can all name the date when we were born, February 14, 1963. But if there's a day 
when you placed your faith and trust in Christ and you were saved, you have a born again day. Now whether you can name that date or not, I don't think it's overly important that we can, but to know that we've had that, we've had that second birthday. And on this second birthday, we get a new father. And it's not the earthly Adam. But it's through this other one man that this verse that we read talked about. And it's the one man Jesus. So what do we get in this much more deal? We, we, we see the things that we, that we were given and Adam threw, those, threw, threw a lot of that good stuff out the window. So what do we gain? What do we gain from Jesus? So, so Jesus gives us, and all of these are going to be much more things, but first of all, he gives us the much more of our justification. The, the ninth verse of the fifth chapter begins with that little phrase, much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath, we read that while ago, from, from wrath through him. Now, but before Adam fell, before, before they partook of the tree and, and, and all of that stuff happened, Adam was just innocent. You and I, if we've been born again, we're redeemed. Totally redeemed. Now, we're, we're, one guy I was reading last night, he, he said, he said we're, we're something that Adam could never be. He said, we're, 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 we're not innocent, we're redeemed. We're, 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 we're covered with the righteousness of, of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, 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 and that's what we get out of this relationship with, with Jesus. Is we get the much more of justification. Then we get the much more, and, and we, we went over these words several weeks ago. We get the much more of reconciliation. And, and, and this is a part of the verse we read a while ago. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. And here's the MM word, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Well, one writer, and I, maybe, it was, maybe it was Adrian Rogers, but he, but he said this. He said, Jesus gave himself for us so that he might give himself to us. He gave himself for us so that he might give himself to us. Listen, it, it, it was never God that needed to be reconciled, okay? God didn't need to be reconciled because, because God, didn't never, God never did anything that he needed to be reconciled for. So the reconciliation is not for him, it's for us. And, 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 and we have this through our relationship with, with Jesus Christ. We are the ones who are reconciled. We are reconciled to God. We, we, are, we, now have, we now have a fellowship Adam couldn't have. Adam didn't have. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and that's what we have in, in, this, in this deal. Well, one, guy, one guy said this. He said, Adam walked with God in the garden, but Jesus lives inside of me. And that's a, that, that's a good thing. And, and, and to boot, he's promised never to leave us, nor forsake us. So, so it'll be there. So he gives us the much more of justification, the much more of reconciliation, and the much more of regeneration. Now, 515 is the verse. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, that's Adam again, many died, listen to what we get in this much more deal. Much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus, abounded to many. Now, Adam, I guess we could say, had a, had a natural life. If we've been born again, and we've placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We don't just have a natural life. We have a supernatural life. We, 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 have, we, we have a supernatural life that comes from the much more of his grace. I, I read something 
Monday, I think it was, and, and the writer of that little article I was reading, he said, he said, Adam lived on this plane. He said, we, because of our relationship with Jesus, we live on a much higher plane than even Adam did. And, and, and sometimes we sit back and we say, man, I wish we could go back there to when it was like it was, but we have much more, much more, much more, the much more of our regeneration. Jesus has come to give life. John 10, 10 tells us this, that he's come to give us life and to give it more abundantly, abundantly. So he gives us the much more of regeneration. And then the, the much more of righteousness in the 17th verse again. And by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. As born again people, and I trust we all are, we are positively righteous in the sight of God because when he looks at us he doesn't really see us but he sees the righteousness of his son Jesus Christ the Bible tells us in Romans 4 8 it gives us this verse it says blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin and if you've been born again, our sin was taken from us and placed upon the Son. So we, we have much more, the much more of our righteousness. Then we have the much more of our reigning. Not, not that kind outside, but the REI kind. Here's verse 20 and 21 of chapter 5. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, what happened? Grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Adam was the head of the old creation. But we as born again Christians, the, the people of God, the children of God, we're going to rule and reign with him, according to the word of God. And, and, and not only that, this, this, this verse back to the 17th verse, we, we not only will reign then, but we, we can reign in, in, in life. It, it, it says toward the end of that verse, it says, and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Life through the one, Christ Jesus. So, so you see that the much more that we get in this relationship with Jesus, it so far outweighs what we could have ever had had we been back there with the Lamb. So looking at it this way, I would rather be Steve Coward in Romans 5 than to be Steve Coward in Genesis 1 because of what I have in Jesus Christ. Now, we all know that Paul is the author here. And he carries this conversation. He carries this conversation into the next chapter. And in the very first verse of the next chapter, he poses a question. You can, you can go back and read all of that fifth chapter if you want to. But, but he opens the sixth chapter with this question. What shall we say then? What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? As he makes his way, we don't have time to read it all, but as he makes his way through the sixth chapter, there are three words that just about the entire chapter hinges on. One of the words we find in verse 6, if you want to mark it, it's the word no. K-N-O-W. In verse 11, there's the word reckon. And in verse 13, there's the word, and it depends on your translation, it might be the word present, or it might be the word yield. But wh whichever it is, it, it means to do that. So, so, so let's, let, let's talk about these three words for the last five, six minutes that we have. There's a, uh, this is on your outline, there's a matter of fact to know about. 
Now here's, here's the sixth verse. It says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That him is Jesus. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves or serve sin. Now, you, you remember, remember when we talked about when we started that we said, one who is a slave, their children were slaves. Well, Scripture tells us, Scripture tells us that our old man was crucified with Christ, with Jesus. That the body of sin might be done away with. So, so that, that part is us. And the reason being so that we would no longer be slaves to sin or serve sin. Now, this, 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 this term here, it, it, it doesn't say think about it. It doesn't say pray about it. It doesn't, it doesn't hint at maybe. It says to know. No. No, with absolute uh, authority, n n know these things. And, and what he's telling us to know is the old relationship that we had through Grandpa, Pa, 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 Adam. That relationship ended when this relationship began. We're no longer slaves to sin because we, 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 we have a new father, if, if you will. We, 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 have a, we, we have a new relationship. The old relationship is, is, has been terminated. And, 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 and listen, the old master, who was the devil, he can't tell you what to do anymore. If you, if you used to work for a company and you got another job with another company, the boss at the old company can't come to you and tell you to come to work at 8 o'clock because he doesn't have any authority over you anymore. And, and, and I tell you tonight, Satan has no authority over us as God's people. Any authority he has, we give him. And we allow him to have. But he has none because we don't belong to him anymore. Because, because our old man was crucified with Jesus Christ. Then there's, there's not only the matter of fact to know about, there's the matter of faith to reckon on them. The word reckon, about the only place that I hear that word, is on the Andy Griffith show. And just the other night, just the other night, Andy and Barney were sitting on the front porch reckoning about things. And when they would reckon about things, you know what they were doing. They were just thinking. They were just, you know, I'm, I think I think so, or I'm thinking about this, that, or the other. Well, that's not that's not that's not God's reckon word. That's not this word. Here's what it says in the eleventh verse of chapter six. Likewise, you also reckon. Now, now that word means to act on the authority of God's word. It's talking about something that is fact, as we've already, as we stated a while ago. It's a it, it's a bookkeeping word. It, it, it's a word that doesn't have anything to do with feelings. Aren't you glad we don't have to base anything on feelings? But I'll be honest. There's some days I don't even feel safe. There's some days you don't feel like doing much of anything. So we don't base things on feeling, but this verse of Scripture here says, You also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. That's a good thing to be, isn't it? But then he goes on and he says, But alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. We, 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 have, been, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's, that, that's eternal. But what we can also be in this life is we can be saved from the power of sin. Because, but because the devil, he's not our master. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. We have been crucified with Christ and, and the devil cannot make any demands. If you remember the old Flip Wilson show when he cross-dressed as, as Geraldine Jones and he come out and he made that statement, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything. The devil cannot make us do anything. Because we don't belong to him. We're indwelt by the Spirit of God. And it's a, it, it, it's a fact. It's a fact and we can, we can act on it. Then there's the matter of 
function. The matter of function to yield to. Now, th this depends on your translation. I'm going to read the Revised Standard Version of, of Romans 6, 12 through 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. Do not yield, may be the word present, do not yield your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but yield yourselves to God as men who have been brought from death to life and yield your members, it's just implied there, it's not worded there, yield your members to God as instruments of righteousness for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. That's a big change from where we started it. Big change. All because we changed masters. All because we changed masters. And the master makes all the difference in the world. You see, if we if we live bogged down in sin, and we live enslaved to sin, and we live sort of trapped by sin. We're, we're just serving the wrong master. We, we've given the old master the reign again. We don't have to do that. Because we have a new master. Because of all of these things that we have gained from the one man, Jesus Christ. It was quite a deal that we got. If somebody were to walk up and ask you, what's the, what's the best deal you ever made? You might have a story that you made a great deal on a car, you made a great deal on a house, or you made a great deal on a boat. I don't know what, what your great deals are. But if you've been born again, I'm going to tell you what your greatest deal ever has been. And that's to swap all that stuff for everything that we got in this relationship. Jesus Christ. It's literally the gift that keeps on giving and will for all of eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you in essence for making every day Christmas morning for us. We have your indwelt presence in our lives. We have you to guide us and to lead us and to direct us. And Lord, we know that when this life as we know it comes to an end, we, we have eternal, eternity in heaven with you. In a place that you've gone to prepare that we'll talk about on Sunday. But Lord, for the here and now, you've given us so much more than we ever would have had in any other way. And God, I pray tonight that as we dismiss from this place, that we won't look at life as things that we've given up, but we'll look at life as things we've gained and things that we have because we have you and we belong to you. I pray tonight that every one of us in this room that we've inherited these things by trusting you to be our Savior. And God, I pray that, that you'll remind us each day of all that we have. Even on those days when the doctor's report may not be good, it doesn't lessen the things that we have in this relationship with you. In days when relationships may be souring, that doesn't lessen what we have in this relationship with you. So thank you for loving us. And thank you for what you have already and continue to give us each day 
of our lives. Let us be faithful to you. Let us yield to you. And let us follow you as you lead us in our life every day. I pray that you watch over and protect us as we travel home. That you would be with all of those that we've mentioned for prayer. And there seem to be more tonight than normal. And I just pray your blessings on them. I pray for Ellen as she sits here tonight. That, that God, I, I pray you do a miracle in her life. Because I know you can. God, I just pray you bless her. Strengthen her. And use her each day. Pray for a family. Pray for Shannon in the hospital. I pray for all the others of our church family that hurt him tonight. You bless them in a special way. Dismiss us under your watch, care, and grace. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen.